thing we haven't covered yet is, uh, I realized uh, just moments ago, is uh, resonance. The concept of resonance is absolutely a central part of uh, Tesla's philosophy. Uh, for instance, when engineers at the time didn't really understand resonance, so they thought that any frequency would work. So when he was first set, setting up an AC power system, they just used some random frequency, and, uh, and it caused some trouble. Well, that's the, thing. the thing is, they didn't understand that resonance is absolutely critical. What's happening in the uh, alternating current power system is that uh, it's ether that's being resonated, not just electricity or the wire, but it is ether itself that's being resonated. So, um, to start with, one of the things that uh, Tesla pointed out, uh, how he came upon the understanding of resonance was by watching uh, uh, children on a swing set. Uh, it's one of the first ways in which you can understand two different, there's two different types of resonance. We're going to talk about both. Now, most, uh, in, most of the time in physics, you only know about one resonance, one type of resonance, but I'm going to tell you about another one. All right, so the first type of, uh, the first way in which we can uh, describe resonance is uh, with a swing, for instance. Okay, so you just push a little bit on a swing, and it comes back and you push a little bit again. Now, each time you're not necessarily pushing harder, if you'll notice whenever you're pushing a child on a swing, you're just pushing again at the right time. When you push again at the right time, what happens is they go even further each time. So what's happening is you're adding the same amount of energy to the system, and the system is keeping that energy so the wave actually becomes larger each time. Now, what in a, uh, in a wave pool or on a string or something else, basically most of the time resonance requires borders. So uh, say, for instance, I've got a, um, a string here that uh, has a wave that's going back and forth on it. And when this wave gets this one end, it bounces back and comes over here, and it's going bouncing back and forth. Now, there's a little bit of energy lost in friction, etc. cetera. Uh, but so long as when it gets back here, if I push on that wave again on its downstroke, for instance, if I push on it again, well, then that wave is going to become bigger. And so long as I put in more energy, then it loses in friction or, you know, like with a swing, there's some air resistance. There's a, there's a variety of ways in which it's losing energy. So long as I put in just a little more energy, then, uh, then it will lose during its, its travel, then this will continually get larger and larger. I can put in very small amounts of energy each time, but the amount of energy stored will grow and grow and grow such that the, uh, the wave will become larger, will become the amplitude will get much higher on it. Now, what this means is, um, uh, earlier you may have remember me talking about sonoluminescence. So what happens in sonoluminescence is, say we have a container here that's filled with a fluid, and I start uh, making a wave go back and forth inside this fluid. Uh, so it's, let's say it's going up and down. As long as we have this single wave, I keep making the amplitude of it higher and higher. Well, actually, what, what you'll end up ha having is a, uh, is, a, is a single wave in the center. So the, uh, let's say that, the, that each side, the the compression area is right here, and the rare, uh, rarefaction areas are here and here. Rarefication is what I like to call it, but apparently it's spelled rarefaction. I don't like it, but whatever. That's the official term for it. So here it's uh, rarefied, and here it's compressed. Now, the whole thing is full, and you can't really tell uh, at first because the entire container is filled with this fluid. Uh, but once the, you keep adding energy to the system at the right time, in other words, I keep keep pumping it and pumping it and adding more energy and more energy and more energy, what ends up happening is eventually the, the medium itself can no longer withstand the amplitude of the wave. So what you'll have in this chamber is eventually uh, as this, okay, so this compresses in the middle and then it goes back and instead of this area being compression and these areas being uh, rarefied, then what happens is the opposite. These areas become uh, compressed and this area becomes rarefied. Well, eventually, what happens is called cavitation. So uh, the, the, the amplitude of it becomes so great that the, the medium can no longer react properly and, and actually it rips apart and you'll end up having a vacuum. So what you'll end up seeing in uh, sonoluminescence, if you look at it, is you'll have this, uh, this bubble where it, it opens up. And what you think you see is a bubble of air that's not actually air. It's a, well, it's a partial vacuum because the, the medium is split apart and now the, uh, the compression, the, the, uh, the fluid is compressed in this area and compressed in that area, and it's opened up a space. Now, there's, there's a little bit of the gas particles, uh, because as it was ripped apart, they left the gas particles. But then as it slams back closed again, those gas particles are crammed together um, because it's, it's just
just the only gas that's in there is the, whatever the fluid is made of. Say it's made of water, which I think that's the, the uh, usual uh, substance that they have in there. Though they have, they have used deuterium as well, uh, and I think they may use deuterium uh, frequently with this exper experiment. But anyhow, um, so the uh, as the um, the particles have broken off, and they've kind of created a gaseous form. It's almost like uh, evaporation uh, because of the vacuum and just the um, the, the violence of the reaction. Uh, so the particles are formed in there, then it collapses back together, crushes together, then uh, some people say it's a fusion reaction, some people don't, whatever, it gives off a light from the very center, just as it's reaching, uh, as, it's, as this hole is closing up. So, so the sun luminescence, that's pretty interesting, but it relies upon uh, resonance, and, uh, and that's what, um, what Tesla used. So, for instance, if I keep adding waves, so now, if say for instance, instead of just one wave going back and forth and adding that one wave, which is what a swing is like, instead I can keep adding waves. If I add the right amount of waves, well, if I keep adding them at the right frequency, what will happen is that some will get back and end up hitting here, and because I'm just doing it at the right frequency, I'll add to this wave that's come back. So say for instance, what I'm, what I'm trying to explain is, instead of just a, uh, a string with a single wave going back and forth, what we instead have is numerous waves on a single string. Um, so what happens is so long as I keep adding to this wave, well, if I add it in the frequency and, and the, in the timing so that when this wave comes back to, to here, so what's going to happen is, let's say these waves are headed this way right now. And this one's going to come and hit and bounce back and then I'm going to add to it. So this wave becomes larger. And then so long as by the time this wave is coming through here and ends up here, I do it again that I've added to this wave. And so long as I add, keep adding to it at a specific frequency, I'm going to pump up each one of these waves. I'm going to make each one of them larger. And this is how uh, alternating current power works. You add energy to the system by pumping. So um, the difference between alternating current and direct current, current power is this. If you were to have, uh, say for instance, a, uh, a tube of billiard balls. So let's, uh, let's create us a tube of billiard balls here. All right. Now, what happens is in direct current, let's say these billiard balls are kind of the equivalent to, um, uh, let's say they're equivalent to electrons or whatever, a uh, part of energy. Um, either way, th this, is, this is just an analogy. It's not extremely accurate, but uh, it is still useful in understanding the concept. Um, in DC current, what happens is we add a single billiard ball here and cram it into the, into the inside, and then uh, these all crush together, and, and what you end up with is a wave travels this direction until one pops out the other end. Now, this, this, this uh, set of billiard balls could be miles and miles long, and so as long as I just cram one in the other side, in, in here, one will pop out the other side eventually. Now, the speed at which this wave travels has to do with how much the billiard balls can be compressed. Uh, but, so that's direct current. You just keep cramming balls in. And, and the, the further that um, this, the, this distance is, in other words, say if I've only got this many billiard balls in here in a tube, and this was that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Say I've only got seven billiard balls. It's going to be easy for me as a human being to physically shove this, this right here into this tube. It's going to poof, just go right in. Not a problem, right? However, if this tube is 10 miles long, the total weight of all those billiard balls will have to be moved. And so for me to try to push that, uh, that billiard ball in is going to take a tremendous amount of pressure. It's going to take a tremendous amount of effort. And, and me as a human being, I would not actually be physically capable of pushing hard enough on it to, to move all those billiard balls. I just wouldn't even, be, wouldn't even be able to do it. This is one of the problems why DC current cannot travel at great distances because of this. So instead, uh, what Tesla thought of is that he took the uh, took it and, and used resonance. So instead of just uh, pushing a ball in one side, instead what he does is he pushes on it a little bit at a time. And so the wave travels and bounces back, and then he keeps adding to that wave. And so he creates this, uh, a set of waves. And so what ends up happening is instead of one ball coming and going in and another popping out the other side, you just keep adding energy to the whole thing. You keep adding and you keep adding, and so pretty soon there's this wave where a ball is halfway popping out one side and halfway popping out the other, and very quickly. And uh, and so the size of the wave, well, the amplitude of the wave uh, can be changed as you keep adding uh, to the system. It can the amplitude can go up and up and up, and you have more and more power. That's how uh, alternating power works. 
So why I've told you all this is uh, to explain some other concepts to you that require you to understand that this is a type of resonance that relies upon borders. There's a different kind of resonance that uh, I believe is what uh, um, Dustin was talking about when he spoke of scalar waves. Now, um, this is going to be difficult to, to comprehend, so um, let's, let's try something. All right. Let's say, for instance, you are um, sitting in a, in a pool of water. So there's a, let's say you're sitting in the middle of the ocean, actually. Uh, one of the things that you can do in that uh, pool of water is, um, well, if you're playing around in a pool, you'll be able to test this out, and if you, you may have actually done it before. But what you do is say you've got this water, and I, I press down on it. And what happens is I'm actually able to press it down a little bit, cause a depression, and then it pops back up after I, after I depress it. And then I can depress it a little further the next time. Okay? And then after I depress it a little further, it pops back up a little further the next time. And so it keep, if I keep doing this, I can keep creating, even though, you know, uh, there's no border for it to bounce off of, the border is the reactivity of the medium, medium itself. So it's not actually a border. It just has to do with how fast this, uh, this particular medium, the water, will react. In other words, after I push it down, how quickly will the water bounce back up? And so long as I match that frequency, first of all, I start out with extremely uh, low frequency, and so I'm, I'm doing it, or actually I start out with a high frequency, but a low amplitude. In other words, I'm not putting a whole lot of pressure on it, because the, the wave I'm creating is not, uh, is not very uh, high, it's very small, but I'm doing it very quickly. And then pretty soon, just like if I were to take a basketball. A good example is a basketball and bouncing. If you start out very close to the ground, you have to do a lot of little strokes, little pop, 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 because it's bouncing a very short, kind of, um, short distance, and so you've got a high frequency. Um, but the, the power that you're putting in is actually uh, very small, so that is a low amplitude. Uh, then what happens with, with our water example here is I start going further and further with it. So in other words, my amplitude is actually of the wave I'm creating is greater. I'm not having to put much, in much more power in, just like the other kind of resonance. I'm putting very little additional power in because it's already going a certain distance. After it pops up, it's actually going to fall back down a distance yet again afterwards, and I'm just pushing it a little further each time, pushing it a little further, a little further. So um, this type of, uh, of resonance can happen right in the middle of a medium without anything nearby. And so in a way, this is kind of like a scalar wave because uh, by scalar, when it, what's happening is it's growing in amplitude uh, as the frequency becomes lower and lower. In other words, as I go deeper, it's at the lower frequency. It's, it, it reaches the peak and trough in a slower period of time. But the amplitude is greater. So there is an inverse relationship between amplitude and frequency. And I believe this is what, um, what Tesla was talking about with scalar waves. So uh, one of the things that uh, is talked about by Mark Twain, who's a friend of uh, Tesla, and uh, other uh, stories is that uh, something that Tesla was capable of doing was making an entire room light up without any source, uh, without any specific source of light. So what would we call this? Well, if I do this, if I resonate the ether, which, uh, like I said, uh, uh, Tesla understood that you could resonate ether. That's how he sent power. Uh, to, uh, to distant points, like for instance, when Tesla lit up an entire town, uh, he did so um, using the principles of res resonance. He was able to send power through the ground to a, uh, to a town and light up the entire town, send them power, and uh, he did this because he understood how resonance works. Um, and specifically because he relied upon the resonance of ether. Tesla never believed in any, in any of that uh, relativity stuff. He was a firm believer in, uh, of ether, and he uh, would tell you that uh, without the ether, without the concept of the ether, resonance is meaningless. It's, it's, a, it's something that can't actually even happen without some sort of medium, um, just like a wave, but uh, yeah, let's not get into that. So say, for instance, you resonate the ether in this way, in this kind of resonance. In other words, you rely upon the reactivity of ether itself instead of some border lines. Like, uh, for instance, whenever, um, let, me, let me give you a quick example of what happens when you are, um, one of the ways to send uh, radio waves is as you charge an antenna, the, the distance that the, um, that the power has to travel, uh, the electricity, when you, when you give, give power to an antenna, the electricity traveling in the antenna 
displaces the ether. So it's kind of like running your, uh, a finger through water. It gives off a wave. And that wave, uh, if you run your finger through water, it's going to look like this as it goes away, but it's going to travel out of, away from it. So if I like ran my finger through water, well, the same thing is if you're displacing ether. And if I displace that ether at a certain frequency, then what's going to happen is you're going to end up giving off waves, uh, the electromagnetic waves from your, uh, your transmitter. And so uh, this is how one of the first ways in which you uh, you could see how uh, transmission of electromagnetic waves was done uh, in early radio, et cetera. And um, Tesla actually had a remote controlled boat that he used uh, very uh, in, the, uh, in the late 1800s. He made a remote controlled boat. Uh, and he used these, these principles of ether resonance. So going back to um, resonating the ether to create light, well, then what's going to happen if I'm resonating the ether specifically, like what I was just showing you here, well, this you could with your uh, with your antenna, you can resonate. You've got actually border lines in which the, um, the the power can actually travel from one end to the other, and your frequency that you're giving off may have something to do with the length of your antenna, for instance. Um, well, that's one way uh, of which to, you can do it. But anyhow, the point is that there's still border lines here. There's still a border line, something to bounce off the other side to take into account. Um, and, uh, and that is, that's, that's that one type of resonance. But this other type of resonance relies only upon the medium. There is no borderline. The only thing that is like a border is the reactivity of the medium. So we know how reactive um, ether is. That's the, the speed of light. The speed of light is, the tr is one of the, uh, um, the speed of sound, for instance, is a, uh, is a property of uh, the air itself. It is not, um, this is the only thing that the speed of sound is. The description, the way of describing a property of air, uh, and that is the reactivity of the medium is uh, is what's being uh, what's being described by the speed of sound. How quickly um, a sound could uh, can travel through it. That's why, for instance, if you were to um, have a, a sound travel from a denser uh, bit of air to a uh, to a less dense bit of air, it would actually change direction some, may even uh, change frequency some. So, if we were to resonate ether in a single location by compressing it, and then allowing it to react. And so, in other words, it's a very, very high frequency operation because we, all, we know that, um, that ether can, can, uh, can you know, send away a wave very quickly. So it's very reactive. The, uh, the speed of light is extremely high. So uh, you're going to have to have a very high, high, high frequency, which is what uh, Tesla was working with, very high frequency. Uh, power was one of his biggest interests near the end of his career. And by the way, the only reason his career was ended was because uh, J.P. Morgan killed his funding. Yes, J.P. Morgan, the one who started the, uh, the crash in the 20s, that guy. So anyhow, uh, so if you are resonating the, uh, the ether, what's going to happen is it's going to be giving off waves. And uh, those waves are going to travel at some given distance, but the point is you have electromagnetic waves that are being created. Now, if you are uh, capable of creating those waves in a certain way, what you're doing is, uh, is causing constant waves to be in one place. And so just like there is power in a resonated wire, at any point in the, the wire there's power there, the same thing is true of the area around where you're just resonating the ether in this uh, um, scalar fashion. Now the scalar, of course, is only going to happen, it is only going to uh, it's only going to scale up as you try to reach a certain frequency and then you can stop. So in other words, the change between frequency and amplitude that will have to cross each other, um, you will want that, that would be something that he would have to start in, in one place and end up in another. But then theoretically, you should be able to just like pushing down the water, you should be able to keep it in one place as you're pushing down. In other words, you keep giving it the same amount of energy. Now it's losing some energy as, as, uh, as well. In other words, if you balance the amount of energy you put in versus how much energy goes away, it just keeps bouncing up and down. And, but what happens though, then that energy is transmitted nearby and there's all these waves being given off. Now those waves, of course, are, uh, can be of a frequency which is the frequency of visible light. And so this explains how it is that light didn't seem to come from any particular source because of the way in which he was using ether resonance to create uh, waves that were going off in all different directions uh, and bouncing off things. So this kind of gives the, uh, an explanation for that light without a specific source. Now there was a specific source, but uh, by resonating in this specific way, it's going to uh, look a little differently than, uh, 
uh, and it might another crash just because he could he could give off diff uh, a lot of different frequencies. Now, what he was doing may have been very dangerous and unhealthy because at the time they didn't understand all the different uh, how the different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation might damage the human body. But either way, uh, it does make a little more sense uh, for that story. So anyhow, this is uh, resonance and ether. Uh, how can this be applied? Well, in your um, uh, when you do some storytelling, you do some writing, uh, you want to incorporate some of these ideas of resonance and how, um, for instance, okay, here's a good idea of how you might uh, use resonance. Let's say uh, that if you were to resonate ether at a specific frequency, you could, um, you could perhaps create a particle. Now, this is something that um, uh, we haven't really talked about before, but say, for instance, if a particle is, in fact, like, a, okay, let's, Let's start with uh, carbon. Uh, so a, uh, a carbon, oops, let's try this. All right, so let's start with a carbon atom. Uh, a carbon atom is going to have um, six, it's going to have six sides. Uh, so yes, that's right, the star of David is a carbon atom. Um, Wow, what do you know about that? The, you know, the carbon, the uh, carbon-based life forms. What do you know? So, what we have here is uh, the path that um, the the waves take. Okay, so as a uh, as a wave travels out, well, it's also spinning. So there's the right amount of rotation and the uh, and the distance. Okay, what happens in a, an ether and an atom is you've got these waves traveling out. Now, the path that they take as they travel out will be altered by the rotation. So what will happen is it as it bounces off of the edge, it may continue to bounce off the edges in a, in a pattern that will create a hexagon, which is, as you'll see in, uh, uh, in one of the cymatics videos, such as uh, water sound images, which I highly recommend, you'll see this hexagon pattern uh, being created. Now, why does this, why does this pattern uh, come about? Because, as I said, there's rotation, and then there is the, the bouncing of the wave. Now, there's an interaction between uh, the waves. Now, What's, a, what's another reason why, other than it's just bouncing, bouncing from place to place? Uh, one of the other things that happens is, as you've got some waves that are going outward from the center, in other words, there's out, waves spreading outward from the center, and then there's also waves which have already hit the outside and are bouncing back in. So as, how do these waves, which are going in different directions, so there's actually what happens in, uh, in waves is that there are particles that are, uh, are present. And those particles, okay, uh, whenever you've got a wave, and these part of, one of the things that will happen is these particles will be shoved closer to each other, and then they'll, they'll bounce off, and these part of this set of particles will be closer to this one, and then this set of particles will be closer to that one. So, this, so as the wave moves forward, there's actually something happening to the particles. Well, if you've got a wave going this direction, pushing particles that direction, and then you've got a wave this, this direction, pushing particles this direction, what happens? Well, yes, when you have to look at it in three dimensions. What happens is some particles go that way, and some particles go this way, and so you create Rotation. This is what happens. As these, let's imagine another set of, of particles right next to this one that I've, that I've drawn, and then um, if, as two waves pass through each other, because they look at them in three dimensions, then what will happen is some particles will go this way, some particles will go that way, and they'll twist past each other. That is how rotation uh, is created, and that is why in every one of these uh, cymatic figures we do have vortices. Like I've shown you in the water sound images, the first set of vortices uh, was a figure eight, which is a hydrogen atom. And so, well, it's got that, and it's got the little, uh, it's got rotation in, uh, in this direction, and it's got rotation in this direction, and rotation in this direction, and then they feed into each other in this fashion. So that is your hydrogen atom. Um, so the reason why these, uh, why you have, this is the first, the very first version of any kind of atom. It's got two waves in it, two waves that can, uh, that are passing each other constantly, going from the center to outside. So we've got, let's look at this uh, in a uh, way. So these are our, our vortices uh, underneath, and these are the waves that are actually happening. So the waves, some waves are going out, and one wave is going in, and they just pass each other, and that's how they create this, this rotation. The rotation is so the waves can pass each other. Same thing is uh, happening here, except because there are more waves, technically there will be six waves, and in return, uh, and, be, and because of those six waves, there will be six vortices. Now those six vortices are uh, what we would consider electrons. So you have six electrons in the carbon atom, and it creates this uh, hexagonal figure. Uh, so anyhow, I told you all that 
uh, because some of the things that we need to, uh, to look at is, so if you can, um, if you can resonate ether, that means that perhaps you could actually create atoms. Uh, if you can manipulate ether properly, then you may be able to actually create elements. Now, this is going to be very useful in, uh, in science fiction writing. Uh, you have to basically add the amount of energy in required. You have to add it at the right frequency, at the right com combination of frequency and amplitude. And not only that, once you have the right frequency and amplitude, you have to make sure that it's done in the right timing. So there's, uh, there's a, a number of, of things that have to be done all the right um, Actually, the, the, the timing is probably part of the uh, frequency. So it may not be all that complicated, but the point is you can use this as an idea for, uh, for science fiction that you could actually build uh, your own uh, atoms. And so somebody could do something where they could like, create um, an element, and that would be useful.